uh, taken care of India, the only problems we had left were Bangladesh and Ethiopia at that time. Somalia came up a little bit later. But if we thought we had problems in India, all I can say is it only got worse. <laughs> and there were times there where I didn't think there was anything more that could happen. Fortunately, we had uh, a man by the name of Stan Foster, who from the beginning was running the Nigerian program, which accounted for 60%, 55% of the population of the whole of the 20 countries in West and Central Africa. It was clearly the biggest job by far, and all he had to do was contend with one civil war, so it wasn't too bad uh, compared to others or what he was going to get on into later. Uh, he got back in 1970, and suddenly there was a problem in Bangladesh. It became independent. Refugees fl flooded back from India, and uh, we had uh, a smallpox-free country, which had been Bangladesh at that point, and it suddenly became epidemic again, and Stan will certainly tell you more about that. So uh, Stan is now... Uh, back and uh, professor of uh, global health at uh, Emory University, uh, but uh, this is a true veteran of the smallpox uh, battles and some of the worst. So, Stan, it's all yours. Thank you, dear. Today I'm privileged to share with you the story of the eradication of smallpox in Bangladesh. The eradication of variola major, the se severe form of smallpox, from Bangladesh, Asia, and the world was a victory for the people of Bangladesh. 10,000 family welfare workers, 40,000 locally recruited emergency field workers, and internationals from 22 countries. Today we celebrate that achievement in their names. It is, um, is also important that we acknowledge the wives and families whose many sacrifices contributed to the success of eradication. I also want to acknowledge the work of my colleagues, Dr. Jorders, Dr. Tarantola, and Dr. Tulloch for their excellent monograph on uh, smallpox eradication in Bangladesh, and the figures you will see on the screen come from that book. In honor of the EIS class of 2008, will you wave your hands, please? Um, I'd like to inform you that after EPI-AIDS 1, there's EPI-AIDS 2 and 3 and so forth. In, the honor, in your honor, I would like to start off with epi aid 58371. On May 5th, 1958, CDC received its first invitation for a major global disease investigation and control effort the control of a major epidemic of smallpox in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. I quote, CDC offer accepted, want up, to t want up to 10 epidemiologists, principally to organize and assist in mass smallpox immunization throughout East Pakistan during the next three to six months. These offices will be in tough situations in rural areas. Led by Dr. Langmuir himself, the founder of EIS, 10 EIS officers at a time worked in shifts over three months. Two quotes from their report established an ethic of humility which all you new EIS officers would do well to emulate. Our findings must be regarded as tentative because we are a strange people in a strange land. This statement is not made as an apology but rather as an invitation to the district health officer, officers to join us in identifying the weaknesses and strong points in our analysis to establish guidelines for smallpox eradication. By the end of that year, 70, 79,000 smallpox cases and 59,000 smallpox deaths had been reported. It is important that you all understand the political context in which the 72 epidemic of smallpox in Bangladesh emerged. In 1970, the Awami League, the major political party in East Pakistan, captured enough votes to establish Sheikh Mujibur Rahman as the Prime Minister of Pakistan. The President of Pakistan refused to convene the Assembly to make the appointment. East Pakistan declared independence. 
Pakistan responded with mass military force and killed over three million Bengalis. Ten million Bengalis, mostly Hindus, left the country for India. Most were settled in refugee camps, the largest of which was Salt Lake Camp near Calcutta. It had a population of about 200,000. In November 1971, two of the camps were infected with smallpox. The diagnosis was made here at CDC by epidemiologists watching CNN, certainly not on government time. <laughs> Before action could be taken, independence was declared on December 16th. Susceptibles and smallpox cases were loaded onto trains, boats, trucks, buses for the return home to freedom. And you can see in that, oh, excuse me, in the picture on the train here, how easy transmission would be from, uh, from susceptibles to, uh, uh, from in infected patients to susceptibles. As can be seen in the arrows, the returning refugees introduced smallpox into the western half of Bangladesh. In the spring of 1972, I traveled to Bangladesh on behalf of the United Nations relief operations in Dhaka. I was assigned to Barasal district. In Sharp Kati, I carried out a 10% sample of the population and estimated 2,000 2, cases and 200 deaths in that Tana. Less than 10% of the cases had been reported. These pictures demonstrate the progression of smallpox rash illness. After an incubation period of 12 to 15 days, the rash develops uh, from macule to pustule to, to vesicle to pustule to scab, and the scab falls off and leaves depigmented spots uh, often recognizable on the face. In 1976, we're going to fast forward to after smallpox eradication. A SCAR survey was carried out of 465,000 people for five or more facial scars that are characteristic of smallpox. Then they carried out uh, verbal questionnaires if the case occurred after independence, December 16, 1971, they determined which year. Here we can see the yellow is what we knew about, the red is what we didn't know about. You can see in 1972 we knew about 10,000 cases and there were 80,000 cases of smallpox we didn't know about. I often ask the question, had I known the truth, would I have stayed? <laughs> Dividing the cases reported per year by the estimated cases from the SCAR survey we were able to estimate the effectiveness of surveillance. And you can see in 72, only 11% of cases were reported. Indicators were critical to documenting successes and identifying failures in the smallpox program. This chart illustrates the two of, two of the th these major indicators, detection interval for surveillance and the containment interval for controlling outbreaks and stopping transmission. In blue, we see the detection interval, the time in days between the onset of rash of the first case in the village and the date the outbreak was discovered. In red, we see the containment interval, the number of days between detection and the date of onset of the last rash case in the village. I will first discuss surveillance and I will then discuss containment. In 1972, our first response to smallpox was to reconstitute the four, four, five four-person pre-war surveillance teams to search for infected villages and initiate containment. For 25 days a month, they visited markets and schools, showed the picture of smallpox, investigated reports of rash, and where smallpox was confirmed, instituted containment. It was used to said that uh, being a member of a smallpox surveillance team was the best method of family planning. At least their wives didn't get pregnant. <laughs> uh, why was surveillance so bad? First, the health infrastructure had been destroyed by the war. Many key health posts were vacant. Ten million refugees 
many infected with smallpox were struggling for survival, food, and shelter. Moslem believes that smallpox was the result of the will of Allah. Smallpox wasn't medical. Hindus believe that smallpox represented the visitation of the goddess Shitlamata, and it wasn't smallpox, wasn't medical. And for health workers, reporting a, small, a case of smallpox was proof of failure to follow their order to vaccinate everyone. Reporting of smallpox often resulted in disciplinary, disciplinary action, including termination. And as historically, a response of, there had been no response to outbreaks of smallpox. People said, why bother? Each dot on the map represents an infected village. And each village, there may be one to a hundred cases. Here you can see our high-tech, computerized information system. Each of the 56 subdivisions had followed their smallpox on this chart identified the place, the number of cases, the date of, date of uh, first rash, the date of detection, uh, any cross notifications, and then the right hand side of the chart followed the, um, uh, the outbreak, and if there were new cases they were recorded, and an outbreak stayed active until six weeks after the last date of rash. At the end of 73, only 39.9% of the cases were known. We knew about 32,000 cases and 42,000 we didn't know about. In December 1973, we developed an emergency plan. Mahbuba Mah Rahman, the director of the malaria program, was a superb leader and helped us. In each um, subdivision, we identified an area smallpox officer, and we chose the best person from health, family planning, or malaria. And then they appointed, in each Tana, a smallpox officer. Surveillance teams were increased from 5 to 30, and WHO ed epidemiologists were assigned to 18 of 19 districts. January 74. February 74, March 74, April 74. Each one of these dots represents a smallpox inf infected villages. In Bengali, smallpox is called Gudi Bashinto, which means spring rash. May, June, July, August. In August, we, we introduced the smallpox reward, 50 taka, for payment to persons identifying an infected village. The, the message was spread wherever people gathered to listen. And the way I describe Bangladesh to my students, I only know one place in the country that you can pee in private. You can see the, the crowding on, uh, on trucks and buses. We used to have a surveillance vaccination team on top of the trains, and uh, it's surprisingly nobody dared to refuse vaccination. <laughs> we printed thousands of uh, reward posters, and m m my best guess is about 500,000. September 74, the decreased transmission during seasonal transmission, uh, things were getting very good. And in October of 74, we were down to 89 infected villages, and I predicted to the press that we would be free of smallpox by December. Lesson to the EIS office, don't talk to the press. <laughs> in November of 74, the two areas at the top of the map in the circle were infected with the worst floods in 20 years. Crops were destroyed, and people sought out in search of food. December. 
<coughs> At the end of December, our surveillance was a little better. We knew about half the cases. January. In late January, uh, as people moved, they moved to the cities of Bogra, Maimansingh, and Dhaka. And in late January, the government decided to destroy the slums in Dhaka, including Karan Bazaar, which was heavily infected with smallpox. I remember DA was at our house that night, and Nick called and says, they're moving, they're destroying the slums. Well, he had gotten a government order to, uh, to allow the, them to stay there, and he was just totally angry. He went to the president's house, walked into the president's house. Fortunately for Nick, neither the president or his armed guards were there. <laughs> February 75. March 75. I see some of you nodding your heads. Can't be. It was. April 75. With the number of infected villages approaching 1,500, our dream of eradication was threatened. I'd like to talk here about the importance of optimism. My deputy at the time was Rangaraj. Rangaraj was a very interesting person. He was the first Indian physician parachutist. He had fought with Stillwell in World War II when they were getting really hammered. He had rescued American soldiers in Korea. First time he came to Bangladesh, I didn't know his history. I sent him to a riverine area. He couldn't swim, but he went anyway. And then he became my deputy at this time. And every day he said, hang in there. It's going to be all right. And it was, we were all depressed. We, didn't, we thought we'd lost it. And every day Rangaraj is in there. He says, hang in there. It's going to be all right. Three years later, I was having drinks. I don't know whether I should say tea or beer, but anyway, having drinks with uh, Ranga in Somalia. And I says, Ranga, how could you have been so optimistic? And he said, I don't think, I didn't think you had a chance in hell in winning. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, you know, when I was with Stillwell in World War II, I learned as a soldier, if I ever thought I'd be dead the next day, I'd be dead. So it was his military training and his optimism, and I see Don knocking his hands. Guinea worm is going to be eradicated, Don. <laughs> optimism is incredibly important. One of the lessons I want to leave you with is the importance of learning from your mistakes. I made a terrible mistake. I introduced a single reward, and the health workers wouldn't tell the public about the reward because they're afraid the public would claim the reward. And so after almost a year, only 30% of the public knew the reward. Well, we learned from that mistake. We doubled the reward to pay both the first public and the health worker, and with a short period of time, 80% of the population knew about the reward. May 75. India was free. Uh, it was hell. Uh, 1,542 smallpox infected villages. We started using experience from India with the house to house search. Each of 10,000 workers was given 1,200 houses to visit. In nine, five to nine days, we could visit 12 million houses. We'd show the picture of smallpox. Travel was not easy. Mud, water. The house-to-house -house search, showing the picture, telling the reward, asking about rash cases. The organization of, of the searches were, was a precision operation. Six weeks before, there was a government order. Supplies were di distributed. Over a nine-day period, there was cascade training, first the district, then the subdivision, then the Tana, and then the search would take anywhere from five to nine days. And then afterwards, we would assess up to 1,600 villages, and then the report and feedback would take place. You can he see here the results of our searches. In the first search, we found 250 uh, villages infected that we didn't know, the second 100, the third 30. 
June 75, with the increased resources, uh, smallpox transmission decreased, also helped by the increased humidity, the decreased travel from, urban to, from rural to urban areas because people were staying out in the agricultural areas, and smallpox went down June. We tracked smallpox cases and the number of active cases and the number of infected villages. In some way, this graph shows that it's going down. But look at it. We still had 1,000 cases and 1,000 infected villages. I went home that night somewhat dejected. The next morning I came in, <laughs> and Andy Diego, who was... Uh, <laughs> who you had referred to earlier had added an I and a worm zero, the zero representing zero smallpox. Uh, I will say, uh, I, I recruited Andy Diego to the smallpox program, and I can remember it very well. It occurred in San Francisco. I said, hello, I'm Stan Foster. He said, I'm Andy Diego. And he said, I read the, I read the, the, the announcement you needed a public health advisor that spoke French and was a good mechanic, and I knew you needed me. End of interview. <laughs> we all miss Andy. July, August, September. We talked about the smallpox interval, although I don't have a lot of data from 74. Four, you can see that in 74, 17, only 17% 17 of outbreaks were picked up in the first week. Why, by 1975, um, uh, we knew over half the outbreaks within the first week. And the importance of this is illustrated in this graph, is that every three days between uh, first rash and detection, the number of cases doubled. And so the importance of early detection of cases is important. Again, we see that from surveillance, we went from a surveillance effectiveness of nearly 12% in 72 to 83% in 1975. But eradication of smallpox requires more than finding the infected villages. It requires interrupting person-to-person -person transmission. This is called containment. This, in my opinion, is the most important graph that came out of smallpox. We set a goal that, that in containment, if you did everything right, there would be no cases after two weeks. And you can see when we start measure, measuring that, 25% of the outbreaks had cases after two weeks. People were getting hungry and going to the market f for food. We provided food. There was a folk belief that you if you entered a smallpox house at midnight through the back door, you wouldn't get smallpox. So we had to have a guard at the front door, a guard at the back door, and another guard to keep them awake. So as we studied, as we studied our failures, uh, in quality of containment improved. Just want to show you the history briefly. Our first attempts at containment, we would isolate the patient and vaccinate the 30 nearest houses. We then found that Smallpox was spreading and people that weren't there, so we added a late evening or early morning vaccination. Then we decided, well, that wasn't enough. We had to have a health worker and an emergency field worker resident in the house for 10 days. They didn't go. They said they didn't have a place to stay. We added job description, maps, and we extended the containment area. But then the most critical thing occurred we started hiring people from the infected village for containment, both as guards and as vaccinators. And this provided a place for the health workers to stay because the health workers were paying them. And we had the house guards, we provided food and water, and we came closer to the, the new case, no new cases after 15 days. We added, as Don showed, pictures of containment books which listed all the residents and visitors, their vaccination, confirmation of take, or any travel outside the area. But each one of these steps was learning from our failures. And I want to share you with the story of Sabur. Sabur was a superb surveillance team leader. He was assigned to Maiman Singh along the Indian border. 
India was smallpox free, had a high reward. I asked him how many smallpox outbreaks, he said 17. I said, how many cases after 15 days, 11? That was a disaster. They could have walked those cases two miles and been rich. So I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm doing everything the book said. I'm putting the location in the house. I got guards at the front door and the back door. I, I'm vaccinating all visitors. I'm vaccinating everybody in the half mile and searching it. And then over a cup of tea, a smile, he said, today I found out why. I am going into the smallpox house and asking for a list of visitors. They are not telling me the names of relatives that came to visit because they didn't consider relatives as visitors. So based on that, we added a list of relatives to the containment thing and uh, solved the problem. But this is really a key message. If there's only one message that you leave this session with, giving people at the field level indicators to judge their own performance and ask questions why is really key. And you also have to have a system where you listen to see so those lessons can be spread. As I said, this is how smallpox sort of evolved. We isolated the patient, guards in the front door and the back door, um, lists of visitors and relatives, vaccinating everybody in a half mile, searching in two miles, drawing maps. This shows pictures, one of looking at the map, one at the vaccinating a half mile. The guy with the stick is the house guard and the guy on the radio is doing cross notifications. This is the containment book where you listed every contact, vaccinating. And you know, when we trained these village vaccinators, it took us about 10 minutes. We would open a vial of vaccine, show them how to open it and how to dilute it. We would vaccinate them, then they'd vaccinate us, and they were almost 100% effective. Um, and I think, as I recount, I think I was vaccinated about 350 times. <laughs> I am also uh, reminded of a speech I gave in Rangpur uh, many years ago that said, you know, when you have a kid and the kids are running off, you've got a kid in your arm, you can't, you can't reach it, you don't have the hand, enough number of hands to get a new bifurcated needle. So it's fine to vaccinate 20 kids with the same needle. Or you could go into a house at midnight and there would be 12 kids lying sleeping on a bed and you could vaccinate them all before any of them woke up. <laughs> Sunday morning, November 15th, 1975. No new smallpox cases were reported between September and November. WHO, my friend DA, I announced smallpox eradicated in Bangladesh on November 14th. On the following morning, three cables. One from DA, congratulations, greatest achievements. One from CDC, congratulations, all delighted. And one from the Bola Island, the Bay of Bengal. <laughs> one active smallpox case is de detected. Karalia. I got on the rocket, the 1924 paddle wheeler, and it took me 12 hours to go the 100 miles to I got on a speedboat and I said, I just hope this case is chickenpox. This is a picture of Shahabuddin, one of our team leaders. Um, we had had some problems with surveillance in Bowler and sent him out there, and he found six villages that had been infected but not reported. And then a young girl reported that there was active disease in Karalia, and this is Rahim Abanu who turned out to be the last case of variola major in the world. I called on the radio DACA and Daniel Tarantola, one of the world's great field things, he's really in the tradition of the French Foreign Legion. Uh, he mobilized surveillance teams, arrived within 40 hour, 48 hours on a launch with motorcycles, <coughs> gasoline, everything he needed, and he took Bola Island apart uh, person by person and no other cases. This is the picture of Bill Knesser, herself an eight-year-old victim of smallpox. She was the one that reported the last outbreak of smallpox. Why eradication? Got about 10 reasons, and then I'll close. 
First was the vision, as Bill said, that eradication is possible. Smallpox is pain, misery, and death, and it is preventable. Why eradication, too? We had good tools, the freeze-dried, heat-stable vaccine, bifurcated needle, excellent diagnostic laboratory under the direction of Frieda Huck. We did, however, have in November of 74, at a critical time, uh, vaccine failures from an imported vaccine. The manufacturer uh, uh, had changed rubber stoppers, and although it passed all the tests, uh, the, it was hydroscopic, and uh, in the heat, the, the moisture came out and destroyed the vaccine. To tell you how you get in trouble as a field epidemiologist, I met the, uh, I met the Canadian consulate, and I said, uh, you know, we had some of your vaccine, it isn't very good, and, but, <laughs> and uh, people are getting smallpox. So a few days later in the Toronto Daily Mail, uh, Bangladeshi is getting smallpox from uh, Canadian vaccine. And then the director of the laboratory has a heart attack. It was not a very easy time. People. My estimate of people is that when we had 9,000 cases in 1972, we had only about 50 people working full time. In 1975, although many of these were part time, like emergency field workers, we had 50,000. So adequate human resources is essential. I'd like to pay tribute to Kamral Huda. Kamral was the medical officer for Chittagong subdivision. And uh, when I first met him, he was the wonderful office bureaucrat. He never got out behind his desk. And I spent one week a month with him for a year and taught him how to be a field epidemiologist. And he, he uh, became an excellent field epidemiologist. Um, one night, Sunday night, I called him and said, how are things? And he said, well, there's a rumor of smallpox on Sandeep Island in the Bay of Bengal, and I'll go at first light. He, got in, he went down to the boat, and the ferry was on strike. He got into a boat. The boat turned over, and he drowned. Um, when I went, revisited his wife several years later, she told the story of how his commitment to smallpox was to prevent scarring in young girls, because he said if young girls are terribly scarred, uh, they won't get marriage, and their lives will be nothing. And you can see here Rahima Banu, who is the, was the last case, uh, her face is scarred. She now has two daughters and her sister. And you can see the burden of smallpox scarring that continues in life. And so Kamaral Huda paid the supreme tribute to smallpox eradication. One of the speakers this morning talked about the decentralization of authority and responsibility. I guess it was Tony's speech, and really important. Each level was responsible. At the town level, there was a town of smallpox officer. At the subdivision, there was the area smallpox officer. And at the national level, each had their own responsibilities. We did not have cell phones. We did not have messaging. We didn't have functioning telephones. We did have radios in a few places. I honestly wonder whether smallpox would have been eradicated if we had cell phones and messaging. The difference is that people were sent to the field to solve the problems. The international and the nationals worked together, and they had the challenge and the responsibility and the authority to make all the decisions. Why eradication? The public became active partners, where in 72 they hid cases, didn't report, thought it was due to due to uh, Allah or Shitlamata. At the end of, the, end of smallpox, 46% of our last 119 outbreaks were reported voluntarily like the public. The indicators, the number of infected villages, the surveillance interval, the interval between the first case and detection, the containment interval, and then finally rash cases. And communications, as I said, were poor, we did have a radio. We did send weekly reports by table. We had monthly feed, uh, feed, uh, feedback, but monthly meetings were incredibly important. Once a month, 
as also in India, we would get together and sit down and discuss where have we succeeded, where have we failed, why have we failed, what we're going to do about it. And after each party, each, each meeting, there was a party. And depending on how bad smallpox would determine the percentage of inebriated participants. <laughs> this graph shows the last. You can see in black, smallpox from the searches. Once we get down to no cases, we started looking at rash cases. And in the January 76 class uh, search, we found 40,000 rash cases that were investigated. Learn from our failures. The non-reporting, the low knowledge of the reward, where we doubled the reward, the cases after 14 days, including community members as containment team members, and field burnout, a combination of long-term WHO staff and short-term staff. It wasn't cheap. If I ran out of money, I called DA and said, I need $500,000. $500 came. If, <laughs> if, <laughs> if uh, we were really in trouble in that April, May thing, and I think I called DA, and DA came out to DACA twice in two months. He even threatened to quarantine the whole country unless the government shaped up. He had no right to do that. He, they believed him. <laughs> uh, last fall, we were meeting in London with some of the smallpox workers, and we sort of said, why was smallpox eradicated? And they came up with three answers. And I uh, think they're worth reading. Phenomenal dedication and hard work of Bangladeshi staff at all levels, especially the surveillance team members. The spree de corps of team and the belief that we would succeed. Monthly meetings and party were important to renew spirit and energy for the next month. I remember one party where I invited 70 Bengalis to dinner along for, for uh, after the monthly meeting. 120 showed up. <laughs> Uh, we cooked everything we had. Any, any can that we could open, we put on the table. We cooked 40 pounds of rice that night. Uh, my wife just about gave up. And finally, was field staff fighting for their needs, not taking no for an answer? There was one epidemiologist who had re been requesting a speedboat, an outboard motor, and for months, and they'd always say, we're going to get it. When uh, a vehicle arrived from Dhaka without the speedboat, he held it hostage until he got his boat the next day. <laughs> Why eradication? It was by the people, for the people. Thank you very much. Dan, that was a beautiful summary of, of uh, the time in Bangladesh, and I can tell you we all felt, here we are, this is the last of variola major, and uh, you just, we had to do everything we possibly could, and uh, it was really tough because it's a very densely populated country, it was moving smallpox in ways we really hadn't seen uh, before. And uh, fortunately, we had a great team, and uh, well, we finally made it. But it, this was really, really difficult. There was a part that uh, Stan uh, did not mention, uh, how we got the money. We went embassy to embassy, and we made appeals and everything else. We could not get donations. We got nothing from USAID, which annoyed me no end. We got 100,000 here and 100,000 there, and the Swiss had come up with a little, and the Austrians and the Brits. And finally, CETA came through, Swe Swedish International Development Agency. They came through uh, in all with about $17 million for us. And the man was pictured on the previous one, Mr. Tranius. Really, it was a personal relationship between the Swedish personnel officer in our office in Delhi and the CETA office uh, uh, from uh, the Swedish International Development Authority 
got them involved. He helped us in India, and that's how we were able to set up impressed accounts, and this is how we were able to make uh, it work in Bangladesh. And we got to pay a special tribute to CETA because this has not been mentioned, but it, they came through with money at a most vital time. There was one event that Sand did not mention, and that was August 15th, 1975. And we had been in India announcing, Indira Gandhi was announcing the last case of smallpox. And, I mean, we are, if India is free of smallpox. And it's freedom from smallpox for the first time in India's history. And I was with the Director General, Afton Mahler, and we made our way to the airport. Uh, we we're on our way to Dhaka to, uh, to uh, meet with the staff and encourage them because that was the end of smallpox. And we got the word, um, the, all flights are canceled. Uh, Sheikh Mujibir Rahman had been assassinated along with his family, father of the country. Uh, then they declared uh, martial law. Uh, there was Indian troops moving to the border expecting huge numbers of refugees. And I guess we all looked at it. And we said, we cannot tolerate another tragedy. I don't think anybody could have taken it at that point. But Stan and company kept their cool. They took all the vehicles, I remember, and ran them off into the villages so, and hid them so that the army wouldn't confiscate them. Things kind of quieted down for goodness knows what reason, and we were able to continue. And uh, October 26th, we, or we saw there what uh, October the last case. 